Take your Bibles, if you would please, and open initially to Exodus chapter number 23. Exodus chapter number 23. And then we'll, uh, we'll move around just a little bit this evening. We have been looking at uh, some of the feasts, and we'll continue to do that. The next one that we're going to look at right now is uh, sometimes it's named a little bit differently, but we're going to look at the uh, Feast of First Fruits. Now, it, uh, there's a little bit of explanation in the very name that is there. There is a rejoicing that comes when uh, uh, the uh, first fruits were brought in. We know how important it was because even uh, when... And by the way, this has been going on for quite some time. As a matter of fact, the, one of the biggest problems that began in the Garden of Eden uh, was when Cain and Abel had uh, brought of their first fruits to the Lord. So this is, not, uh, this is nothing that is brand new, but it's something that God wants us to keep in mind. What it is, is it's an opportunity then to, for Thanksgiving. It's an opportunity for uh, presentation. We'll look at some of those things. And also, uh, it's a, a, an importance of the discipline of restraint in some of the things that are here. And so, notice if you would please in Exodus chapter number 23. Look at verse number 16, if you would please. The Bible says, And the feast of harvest, the first fruits of thy labor, which uh, thou hast sown in the field, and the uh, feast of ingathering, which is in the end of the year, when thou uh, hast gathered in thy labor out of the fields. Three times in the year all thy males shall appear before the Lord God. Thou shalt not offer the, the blood of a sacrifice with leavened bread, neither shall the fat of my sacrifice remain until the morning. The first uh, of the, the first fruits of thy land thou shalt bring into the house of the Lord thy God. Thou shalt not see thy kid uh, in his mother's milk. Now, He's given instructions and given directions for some of these things, and there's a purpose behind it. Some of the purpose is uh, explained a little bit more uh, when we come to the book of uh, Leviticus, chapter number 23. It gives a little bit uh, more information. So if you would please keep something right there because we are going to turn back to Exodus. And, uh, but turn over, uh, if you would please, to the very next book, Leviticus, chapter number 23. Leviticus, chapter number 23. And look, if you would, please, beginning in verse number 10. The Bible says, Speak unto the children of Israel, and say unto them, When ye be come into the land which I give unto you, and shall reap the harvest thereof, then ye shall bring a sheave of the firstfruits of your harvest unto the priest. And he shall wave the sheave before the Lord to be accepted for you. On the morrow, after the Sabbath, the priest shall wave it, and ye shall offer that day when ye weigh the sheep uh, and he lamb without blemish of the first year of a burnt offering unto the Lord. And the meat offering thereof shall be two tenths deal of fine flour mingled with oil and an offering made by fire unto the Lord for a sweet savor. And the drink offering thereof shall be of wine, the fourth part of a hen. And ye shall, <laughs> I don't know what the other three parts of a hen are, but uh, Oh, come on, just stay with me here just a little bit, would you? Uh, but uh, verse number 14, And ye shall eat neither bread, nor parched corn, nor green ears, until the selfsame day that ye have brought an offering unto your God. It shall be a statute forever throughout your generation and all your dwellings. Now, the interesting thing that uh, the first fruits is this. The fact that God said, I'm going to bring you into the land, I'm going to give you the land, and it's going to produce the things that you're going to need. The interesting thing about it is, as long as they obeyed, God said, I'll make sure that your, your crops uh, are bountiful. I'll make sure that uh, the animals that you have are prosperous because you recognize where the blessing comes from. By the way, that is a good reminder for us to keep in mind. And by the way, as they celebrate these, uh, what we would call holidays, holy days, it is a feast. It is a celebratory time where they're bringing a remembrance and for a purpose and a reason. While we were there this, uh, this last time uh, in Israel, they were celebrating Purim, which is basically a celebration that says we were uh, saved uh, during the events of Haman uh, when Esther was there in the court. And so there's uh, some celebrations that take place in a remembrance of how they were delivered, 
how that they were cared for. But all of this is a reminder to say this, God, we understand that you're watching us. And so you're watching over the things that we do. We're watching over our labor. You're watching over the production of that labor. And by the way, uh, the reason why these things are, are mentioned, and we'll turn back and forth here just a little bit uh, between the two. So if you want to leave a marker there in Leviticus chapter number uh, 23, we will be turning back to it here in just a moment. But if you would, please turn back over to Exodus, if you would, chapter number 23. These are going to be the two places that, uh, that we reference tonight. And there's a, a couple places in the New Testament that we want to look at. But in this, there are three aspects to this uh, feast of the first fruits. Now, we understand that what they're to do is to, they're to gather up some of the sheaves and bring it into the, uh, to the priest, one to be thankful, and then to offer it as an offering to the Lord. It is a reminder a little bit of how that we are supposed to recognize some of the first fruits that we gather in, in a week's time, month's time, year's time, however that works, and however uh, kind of our resources come to us, and then bring them and present them to the Lord. It is one, to say thank you, God, for taking care of these things. Two, we want to make sure, and by the way, some of the things that, uh, that God instructs them to do in uh, some of these first fruits is partly because they want them to be able to not only take care of their needs, but someone else's needs. And uh, it is, is mentioned in the book of Exodus there, just a little bit before some of the uh, verses that we read. But I want to point that out just a little bit, if I may. So in Exodus chapter number 23, look if you would please in verse number 9, because the Bible says, Also thou shalt not oppress a stranger, for ye know that the heart of a stranger, seeing ye were strangers in the land of Egypt. So in other words, he says, you were not exactly where you were supposed to be, and I still took care of you. And so keep this in mind, when you have somebody else that comes your direction, you take care of others also. He said, so I'm going to give you sufficient for you and then for someone else also. Part of the reason why God blesses you and I is so that we can take care of our needs. And he, he fully intends that. But he also wants us to be mindful that there's others that are need around. And it doesn't matter what it is. Tonight, even as I, I knelt down, I began to pray, and I, I've gone over the prayer sheet already, but there's a few things that catch my attention that we don't list on there. Sometimes when we raise our hands and we say there's an unspoken request, some of those things are something that we don't really present to everybody, but it's things that we may be praying for. So as I kneel down and begin to pray, it's like, Lord, thank you for taking care of the needs that I have. Thank you for, and then I begin to look at other folks that said, there's a need that is here, and God, would you please take care of that need? God always wants us to be mindful that we're, we can't be so selfish that we only look at God takes care of me only. God takes care of me so we can be a help and a blessing to others. And we can be a testimony saying, look how good God is. And in that instance, they say, you know, he has been good. We'll rely upon him also so that the next generation and that somebody else can be helped also. That's the purpose in God's blessing to us so that we can take care of our needs, so that we can have the resources to help care for someone else and let them see the goodness of God. And so in that manner, it is a reminder of some of these things. That's why he calls it a feast of the harvest. He said, when the harvest comes, he says, I want you to celebrate. And I know sometimes you think, well, it, it seems so meager. Well, it's a whole lot better than nothing. And so in that manner, God is saying, I've taken care of things. And so in that, it reminds us of this. The very first thing about the Feast of uh, the First Fruits is this. Number one, it's offered to the Lord. It's offered to the Lord. So we see here in verse number 16 of Exodus chapter number 23, and the Bible says the Feast of the Harvest, the first fruits of thy labor. So God fully intends for you and I to put forth effort, not just to <laughs> sit back and say, well, God, if you're going to do it, you're going to have to do it. He's going to say, no, you're going to have to do your part also. It reminds me a little bit when, uh, when I was in Bible college, I remember uh, I would, there was a young man that happened to be in my, uh, in my dorm room at the time. I was a dorm monitor, and so I had to try to help uh, keep up with the different fellows and sometimes the younger fellows that would come in. And I can remember uh, that uh, as he was there, I, I, he would come in, he'd be praying, he'd be things of that nature. And uh, and I ask him, I, I won't mention his name because Mrs. Whitworth might recognize it. Uh, <laughs> we are, I don't know why it is. Brother Caleb, did, did everybody in your room, did they have nicknames too? 
No, okay, and so, uh, but uh, everybody, in, it, it, everybody in our room had a nickname to some degree. Okay, uh, and you'll, okay. His, na his nickname was Twinkle. And, uh, and so, you know, you have an idea that, all right. But uh, nonetheless, it was one of those things where uh, I'd come in and, I, and I'd ask him, I, he, he was praying, and I called him by his name, and I said, uh, how's things going? He said, well, I need to find work. And, uh, and I said, uh, well, have you, have you gone out and put any applications in? He said, well, no, I'm just praying that God will, will, uh, will supply the need. I said, well, I, I, I think he will. I said, but you're going to have to do something. I said, he's probably not going to send something your direction. You need to go fill out some applications. That was the day before filling them out online and all the rest of it. You literally went to the business. That's my preferred method anyway. And uh, just go there. You fill out the application, talk to the individuals that are there. And, he, uh, and he'd just say, no, I'm just praying. God will bring it in. You know, a week later, uh, he's still praying. I said, have you filled out any application? No, I'm just praying. That God... And pretty soon he's on the final financially withdrawn list and all the rest of it. It's like, all right, Twinkle, you're going to have to go and you're going to have to fill out some applications. I I'm glad that you're trusting in God, but you're going to have to put forth some effort too. God wants to see if you're willing to work at least a little bit. Uh, to take care of uh, the rest of things. So the offering to the Lord is in this thanksgiving, he says, Lord, thank you for the ability to labor. Thank you for the place to labor. Thank you for the ability to labor. Thank you for the health to labor. Thank you for the ability to, to have the skill that is necessary to labor. And so part of that is a recognition that God has provided not only a resource, but he has provided you the wherewithal to do what's necessary. And he oftentimes wants us to recognize that he is still the one that gives strength. He's the one that gives ability. He's the one that gives opportunity. So in this manner, part of that is to say, Lord, we're grateful for what you've done. Did you know that in a, uh, the first colonies that came to our, our, our land here in America a lot of them almost starved to death. The reason being is, as they came over, they had the money to gather up the resources to get on the boat to come over here to a new land. But when they got over here, they were Englishmen and they, they, wouldn't, they, they, they didn't want to dirty their hands or soil their hands to labor. They expected everyone else to work and take care of them. Pretty soon they found out, ah, it's not really going to work that way over here. It might have over there, but it's not going to work here. You're going to have to put forth the effort too. And uh, uh, that's, that's part of the reason in a perfect society, let me put it like this. In a, if people were perfect, communism would work. Yeah, let that sink in for a second. Unfortunately, we're not perfect people. And that setup is not going to work. Now, the idea is everybody works Everybody puts in so that everybody would have some. Unfortunately, you're always going to get one that says, oh, I'm kind of got it in the back today. You know, and I, I don't think I can work today. And then it's like, oh, my hand's hurting today. I don't think I can work today. And, uh, but I'm still hungry, so I want to take some. There's always going to be that occasion. So like I said, in a perfect environment, perfect people, perfect society, it'd work well. Unfortunately, it doesn't work well and never has and never will until, until there's a perfect theocracy when Jesus sits on the throne and he'll be able, then it will work, all right? But until then, it's, uh, it's just not going to and uh, it never has and it's not going to work now very well either. But that offering to the Lord is to remind her of this. We are to put forth our effort. Verse number 16, I'll go on from there. And the first fruits, uh, uh, the feast of the harvest, the first fruits of thy labor, which thou hast sown in the field, uh, the feast of ingathering, which is at the end of the year, thou hast gathered in thy labor out of the fields. The very next thing that God wants you to understand as far as this feast is concerned is the next part in verse number 17, because it says three times in a year, all the males shall appear before the Lord God. What he is reminding us in this is this. There is a presentation of self because as you're bringing in, so let, let me ask you this. When God was examining the, the, the things that were brought, when Cain and Abel brought their sacrifices to the Lord, it wasn't necessarily the sacrifice that was a mess, that was a problem. They took it personally and all of a sudden now there was an issue because the presentation of who they were was in question. It wasn't necessarily the, the offering that was there, 
because uh, what they're supposed to do, and it, you, you know, sometimes the very first fruits that come in are not always the, the most pretty. They're sometimes not. And, uh, but God said, that's what I'm asking for. I just want the first. And uh, he said, the best may come later. He said, but I'm just asking for the first. So in that manner, that presentation of self is that obedience that there's two aspects to this. One, it's personal. I have to go. Nobody else can go for me. I have to present these things. That's why it's imperative for you and I to understand. And for this feast of first fruits was this. You're going to have to bring your labor to the Lord. And so in that, it was a very personal presentation. You're going to have to bring that. You're the one that's going to have to bring those things. You know, it's not a, it's not a negative thing to bring what you're offering to the Lord. It just isn't. The only problem is sometimes it's like, well, I guess I could have done a little better. Well, I guess I could have. And uh, that, that's something that sometimes we have to consider. Lord, have I done my part? Have I done my best? This is what I have. And uh, understand this. It's not to evaluate necessarily and, and to, to chide you. The Bible already reminds us in the New Testament that's not his interest. His interest is the fact that you're willing to come to him, no matter whether it's a lot, whether it's a little, whether it's whatever the case. He just wants you to bring it to him. In that, the presenting of self is this. It's personal, but it's also present. You can't put it off. It's got to be done. It's got to be done in, that, in the timely fashion that God has asked it to be done. So in this nature, it is a reminder of this. The Feast of first fruits was you and I have to do it. We have to recognize it. Nobody can do it for us. It is a reminder also as we get to the New Testament, we'll look at that here in just a little bit, the importance of how God says you are going to have to answer for who you are. I can't get saved for anybody. Every person has to accept Christ on their own. And so in that manner, there's a reason that every single person has to make that acknowledgement. We can't do it for them. I know that there are religions today that say, well, if, if they happen to be in this holding part, if you give enough money and you pray, we can get them out of there. Unfortunately, it doesn't work like that. And so because of that, a person can only be forgiven by themselves and the Lord Jesus Christ is the only one that can do that forgiving because his blood is what has to be applied. So as much as when we're praying for our lost loved ones and say, Lord, would you please save them? What we're asking God is he's willing to save them and he wants to. What we're asking God, please let them cross the path of somebody that can get the, get the gospel to them. Please give them an opportunity. Please give them an open door. Please allow them to listen. Please soften their heart. That's what you're asking when you say, Lord, please save them. Because uh, he is willing to save and he will save, but there has to be that request that comes. So the, the presenting of self in the, in the first fruits is they have to present themselves. And so here I am, uh, I have to present myself. It, it's it's kind of like, like that oral book report that you know you've got to give. You don't look forward to it, and you know you wrote it five minutes right before class started anyway, and so uh, you, you know it's not going to have the depth of thought or idea that it could have had had you put the time and effort into it. And so in that instance, sometimes you have to say, Lord, I, I, I really messed up. And he says, I love you. Let's just do better. He, he, and it is just a reminder of the Lord is always welcoming. He just does. He's not, he's not wanting to destroy and crush. That's not his plan. That's not what he wants. He wants to encourage you to go on, to keep, to improve, to, to refine. And uh, that's part of the, the personal presentation to him. And so when I say that it, it's present, it's not only personal, but it's present. It can't be put off. It's like, okay, well, I'll go see him tomorrow. It's like, he won't be here tomorrow. You've got to do that now. It's necessary right now. Today is the day of salvation, as scripture says, and it is a reminder of that. And uh, the very last part of the uh, first fruits, the harvest uh, feast of first fruits, is there is also an element of restraint or discipline. So if you would please, and uh, now we're going to turn back to Exodus 23 in just a minute, but if you would please turn over to Leviticus chapter number 23. The very last verse that we read talking about this feast is a reminder of this. Verse number 14 of Leviticus chapter number 23 says this, And ye shall eat neither bread, nor parched corn, nor green ears, 
until the selfsame day that ye have brought an offering unto your God. So in other words, it says, you, you need to offer this before you can begin the feasting part of things. And, uh, and before it's offered to the Lord, uh, you may not partake of it. And so that is what he is instructing them. It shall be a statute forever throughout your generation and all your dwellings. So what God is saying is this. He says uh, there is some restraint that is there of discipline. Will you do what you're supposed to do in the order that you're supposed to do it? Uh, and uh, will you refrain from that? I think it's kind of interesting. Uh, maybe you have done this before. You, you've sat down at the table and as the little ones are getting ready to eat, uh, they're starting to reach for that little chicken leg that is there, or the chicken nuggets or whatever is there. And said, uh, uh, we got to pray first. And it's like, oh, <laughs> or they have it right here. It's ah, uh, uh, okay. <laughs> and uh, it's that, uh, that element where you say we have to ask the blessing for the food before we eat it. There, it shows a little bit of restraint that is there. It shows the fact that we need to recognize God and what is going on before we partake of things. And even in the feast that is here in this day, it is a reminder of that very thing. Whether you understand that, uh, that we somewhat recognize this just a little bit when we, before we eat, we ask the Lord's blessing on the food that is there. What it is, is it's showing a little restraint instead of just sitting down there and just start gorging without recognizing where it came from, who supplied it, and recognize our God and, and all the sustenance that he provides. So it is a, a good thing to be mindful that these things are even incorporated into our Western, uh, even to our Western culture. I, I, I want to mention, uh, I, I was very excited this past week. I have, uh, I have on many occasion, there's, a, there's about four or five different synagogues or gatherings. There's even a, a yeshiva up here in the South Bend. That is a, a school, a Jewish school. And, uh, and I've, I've contacted the, the different rabbis on different occasions and just asked them if they'd be willing just to speak with me for a little bit. And uh, this past week, one of the, uh, one of the rabbis sent me uh, a message and said, you know, there are some Jewish classes that are on Zoom on Monday night. And he mentioned those things. And he said, and you're welcome to call me if you'd like. And, uh, and I, was, I was excited for that. Uh, and I will contact him and talk to him some more. Reason being is, uh, not because I'm wanting to, I, I can't be Jewish, I'm too, I'm too English. <laughs> and, uh, but uh, in that manner, uh, I want them to know one thing. What is this? I and the, the people that in our church support Israel in the difficulties that are going on over there right now. I want, I want folks to understand that. I, I want them to know that we want to be Israel's friend. Now, do theologically, do we see things differently? Yes, but it doesn't mean that we cannot be somewhat cordial and neighbor and, and, uh, and be uh, in the manner that God has instructed uh, to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Now, we pray for America, but I also pray, Lord, please take care of your people there. Do they believe like we do? No, not exactly. Are they a great deal sometimes more liberal in their thinking than, than we are? Yes. But at the same token, none of those things are, are going to prevent me from asking God to take care of them and uh, to take care of the IDF as they're, as they're fighting and, and trying to uh, keep things in line along those lines. And so in that manner, God is reminding us to recognize him in every single aspect. As I am learning a little bit more about certain things that are here, I'm excited for us as it comes up in April uh, that we'll be able to uh, partake during the 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 Passover time, uh, the Seder meal, and put things together. I'm looking forward to that. I really do. Matter of fact, I was uh, going through and looking for the different uh, things to partake in that. I look forward to some of those things. In that manner, it is just a reminder that our world is a big world. And we need to remember that people need the Lord, no matter where they are. And so there needs to be some connection in some manner in order for that to take place. God did that for us. He did it uh, in a major part that I want to begin to look at now for just a moment, if I may, because he came to the Jewish people, but he also made an open door for you and I, the Gentiles, to be able to have a way to get in. Now, we may not recognize all the same 
feast days and all the procedures and all the things along those lines. But it does not mean that God has, uh, has set aside uh, mankind or a certain group of people or anything. He has opened a door. I'm not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And so that makes it a wonderful thing for us. Take your Bible, if you would, please, and turn to the New Testament now. Uh, well, before you do that, hang on. Uh, you're right there in Leviticus. I want you to turn back to Exodus chapter number 23 for just a moment. Because right after the feast of the, uh, the, the first fruits, he said, this is what I want you to remember here just a little bit. Notice, if you would please, the verses that we read. We read down to verse number 19, but I want you to notice in verse number 20, he says this. Behold, I send an angel before thee to keep thee in the way. And by the way, notice that that angel is capitalized. It is divine. And since that's a case, this is an Old Testament theophanies that is talking about how that Jesus is going to take care of things. And so in that manner, it says, Behold, I send an angel before thee to keep thee in the way and to bring thee into the place which I have prepared. Beware of him and obey his voice. Provoke him not. For he will not pardon your transgressions, for my name is in him. And, uh, and then it goes on to say, But if thou shalt indeed obey his voice and do all that I speak, then I will be an enemy unto thine enemies and an adversary unto thine adversaries. For mine angel shall go before thee and bring thee into, uh, into the Amorites and the Hittites and the Perizzites and the Canaanites and the Havites and the Jebusites, and I'll cut them off. And thou shalt not bow down to their gods, nor serve them. So he is reminding them of those things. In that instance, it is a reminder of how God, if you will obey some of the uh, tenets that he has put in Scripture, that he is going to be a blessing to you. So in this uh, uh, Isaiah chapter number 43, verse 15 through 21, reminds us how that God is going to begin to make us a brand new creature. But in that manner, it is a reminder that God is going to care for things. So if you would then, turn to 1 Corinthians chapter number 15 for just a moment. 1 Corinthians chapter number 15. As Paul is beginning to teach the church at Corinth here, he is beginning to give them some instruction. And he makes this statement <coughs> as he is teaching them. He is reminding them of some of the things, uh, and a matter of fact, he is reminding how that the offerings have been made. Offerings should still be made to God in every aspect because we recognize that he is where those things come from. And notice even in the offering that is there, he mentions the very thing of how that uh, a, a new procedure somewhat is taking place. Because he mentions it in this manner. 1 Corinthians chapter number 15, look if you would please in verse number 20. But now, so he is reminding us this very moment, this is a present tense thing. But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the, here's the word, first fruits of them that sleep. In other words, he is reminding us now of that very feast thing that has taken place in the Old Testament, the gratefulness that is going to be there, the personal thing that is going to, the present thing. And he is reminding those first fruits are a shadow of greater things to come. So when you recognize that Jesus was, if you want to put it like this, the first fruits of what is going to take place, the resurrection, how that God is going to call his people and take care of them and the big harvest will take place. It is a representation of how that even uh, in the Old Testament, he is putting the things in the future, a shadow of things that already have been seen. And that manner is this. Now, the main harvest will take place when the trumpet sounds. And that big harvest will take place. And so he is reminding us that, look, that first, first fruits that have already taken place, you see how the dead can raise, right? The Lord Jesus did that and showed you that it can be done, and he is powerful enough to do that. The next part of that harvest will be the main harvest that takes place. And so it is a shadow of the Old Testament. What I'm going to pull towards the end of all this is this. God recognizes the feasts and the celebrations because a lot of very instrumental things that are a picture of things to come, come from these feasts that, are, that have taken place. And so because of that, there is a great deal that is yet to come that is all, already been foreshadowed by some of the things that he has done. God operates according to somewhat procedures. He just does. 
uh, numbers play a big part in the Old Testament, all right? The number 40 uh, pictures a lot. The number seven pictures a lot. The number three pictures a lot. Now, none of that to say I'm going to, by any stretch of the imagination, take any, any type of idea on trying to guess when the Lord is coming. I'm not, because <laughs> I'm hoping it happens today. If it doesn't happen today, I hope it's going to happen tomorrow. If it doesn't happen tomorrow, I'm going to hope it happens the next day. It is going to happen. It might happen in my lifetime. It might not. But I know it's imminent. It's going to happen. And that main harvest that's going to take place will take place because the first fruits have already taken place. Since the first fruits have already taken place, now the main harvest is the next one that is to come. So in this manner, it is a reminder of the shadow of things that have already taken place, pictures of things that will take place more in the future. Because, let me, let me read for you one other verse out of Romans chapter number 8. Because as Paul has given instruction to, the, to his people and to God's people, he reminds us of some very pertinent things. Verse number 23 says this, And not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves grown within ourselves, waiting for that adoption to wit, the redemption of our body. So he is reminding us again of what is going to take place. And some of those things are a picture of some of the feasts that have already been celebrated and the importance and the impact along those lines. Now, as I said, as I get to the, the end of some of the feasts, we'll pull some of this together a little bit more of a prophetic statement of what God is looking forward to doing and what you and I can look forward to in the, uh, in the future. But the, the first fruits are basically three things. One, it's an offering to the Lord of thanksgiving. Number two, it is presenting of self. It is a very personal presentation and a very present thing. You can't put it off. And then there is restraint that is there. That means that there is a, the, the, you and I need to make sure that there's discipline in our own lives before we uh, uh, begin to accept all of the things that uh, God has uh, given to us. And so uh, there's a few other lessons to be learned from some of these, and uh, we'll look at those as we move on just a little bit. All right, let's all stand. We'll have a word of prayer, and then we'll be dismissed this evening. All right, let's pray. Father, thank you again for the opportunity to be in your house. Thank you again for your precious kindness. I do ask that you'd please just continue to work in our midst to understand a little bit more of thy word. Thank you again for the things that you do, and I ask that you'd please just help us now to do your will. In Jesus' name, amen.